Why are we Americans on the march? Is it because of... Pearl Harbor? World War II was a turning point in the history of social psychology. I mean, a turning point in, like, everything, but, but, but also social psychology. It was the kind of major event that shook the lives of so many people. And, and that's the thing. It was a fundamentally people-oriented event, the kind of thing that social science is all about. There were concrete issues affecting real people's lives, and there were scientists ready to use their tools to understand them. In October 1941, the United States Army officially established its research branch. The goal was to use the research methods of social science, which were actually pretty new at the time, to understand soldiers' attitudes, which would inform various administrative decisions. Prominent researchers from all over the place joined the cause and developed studies that were fielded among more than half a million actual soldiers. It all led to this four-volume series of books released by a special committee of the Social Science Research Council, and they're still being cited today. Another influence of the war was that Jewish academics in Germany were forced to flee, and one of them, Kurt Lewin, left the Berlin Psychological Institute in 1933 and ended up establishing important social psychology research programs in the United States. And the thing that makes Lewin especially notable was that he was of the mind that a problem was only worth studying if addressing it would make a difference with regard to real-world problems. I mean, his biography was titled The Practical Theorist. For example, during the war, the U.S. government wanted to convince people to eat more organ meats, things like kidneys and hearts, because they were less expensive, more readily available, but also rich in protein. Everyday citizens, though, were resistant to the idea, you know, because <laughs> of course they were. So Kurt Lewin began a program of research on how to overcome this resistance. My point in all of this is that social science has the ability to respond to real human problems, to examine these things as they happen in the actual world. But we don't always do it. By the late 1960s, some psychologists were reflecting on their field, thinking that it sure seemed a lot more like fun and games than the ideals that Lewin had been espousing a few decades earlier. In fact, one of these critics wrote, Clever experimentation on exotic topics with a zany manipulation seems to be the guaranteed formula for success. Whoever can conduct the most contrived, flamboyant, and mirth-producing experiments receives the highest score. This discontent seems to have persisted at a low simmer over time, occasionally bubbling over into claims that the field is in a crisis. The feeling was that the field was lost, no longer knowing what to study and how to make a difference. And now some of this seems to be due to this prominent view that science's chief concern should be building theories of basic principles, and that the work applying these insights in the world is somehow less valuable. But I think we're starting to see a change in this. I want to just read what I think is a really useful insight by the social psychologist Daniel Katz, who was writing about the work coming out of the Army's research branch. This is from 1951. The strategy of social research should not be a complete concentration upon pure science and a postponement of all effort until we have a full-spun theoretical framework. The interaction of basic and applied research should prove more productive than the concentration upon the one or the other, with resulting isolation of theory from practice. As the research branch has shown, we can make progress in the immediate future by utilizing the resources so readily available for applied social research in as broad a scientific framework as the development of the field permits. You're listening to Opinion Science, the show about our opinions, where they come from, and how they change. I'm Andy Luttrell. And this week, I'm excited to share my conversation with Neil Lewis Jr. He's an assistant professor of communication at Cornell University, and he studies social inequities as they relate to health, education, and the environment. And as you might guess from my introduction to this week's episode, Neil also is a vocal advocate for doing social research in the places where social stuff is happening. 
By going into the field, getting natural data, and working with community partners, he's intent on doing research that'll make a difference. As you'll hear, he also values bridging across the social sciences, both in his own work and in the writing he does for general audiences. So, let's jump right in to my conversation with Neil Lewis Jr. You know, in terms of the broad strokes of what you do, I wondered what your perspective is on like, what what are your goals? Like you are a social scientist who has lived in different worlds within the social sciences mm -hmm. and who's dabbled in different areas from health and education to other forms of communication. What What is at the heart of it? Has it changed for you over time? And if it has, what was it and what is it now? Yeah, I mean, what I do has changed over time, but there is a sort of common core of really trying to understand how inequities work and how to um, address those, reduce those. Um, so yeah, and by way of quick-ish background of how I got here. So I have bounced around the social sciences a bit um, and that really started in undergrad. Um, so I studied economics and psychology then, mm. but my research career began in sociology actually. Oh. Um, and so, um, so that's what I did my undergrad research in. And I think, you know, if I look back, that's part of why you see me draw mostly on those three fields um, is hmm. because of growing up in the three of them, between the three of them. But that's where I started and then went to graduate school in social psychology. But really the big issue I was um, passionate about then and continue to be passionate about is the issue of education disparities, right? So hmm. that's what I went to graduate school to study. But as I worked on that um, and trying to think about interventions to address education disparities, the further you read into that literature, the more you get to health disparities, right? And mm. so that's how that became my second thing. Uh, well, so so could you explain that a little more? Like what, what what's the the dividing line in the tree where it's where <laughs> health and, and education have the same origin? Yeah, so um, it goes back to that um, inequality issue, right? That when you look at things that affect uh, student learning. And when I started working in education, I was really focusing first on early childhood education. So some of the work that I was doing was actually looking at like, what is learning like in elementary school, for instance. And so you run into things like how poverty affects um, health outcomes um, and also educational outcomes. Uh, free lunch becomes a variable that matters a lot in education studies and, you know, Education researchers use it as a proxy for poverty level, but free lunch also tells you something about what are health opportunities um, or lack of opportunities for students and their families, right? And so that's how sort of moving in that direction too is like really thinking about the broader health landscape that would affect students' ability to learn. And so, yeah, went into health as that uh, second thing. And then Eventually, that also led into environment. Uh, that's how that became my third domain, because many health issues can also be traced, at least in part, to issues of environmental injustice, right? So that's how then those three became my like three big domains that I continue to sort of bounce between. So it's interesting because if there's this you can't separate health from education from environment and nor can you really separate sociology from economics, from psychology, from communication, even though we all try to live that <laughs> right, way? Right. Um, so what what do we gain from thinking holistically about how all these things come together that maybe goes under the radar when people are a little too siloed off into one of those domains? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're trying to... Um, so the reason I talked about the intervention focus a lot is that I think... If that is a goal of yours, um, right, trying to make changes in some of these outcomes, then you really need that holistic understanding that focusing on one set of variables, you know, psychological variables only, or the economic variables only, or the sociological variables only, or the messaging only, and you miss how it's connected to the others, it becomes harder to develop effective interventions. And so that's why I find it helpful to draw in all those fields. And then increasingly, I haven't talked about political science yet, but uh, that, <laughs> but, that went to the mix. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, just given how politicized this country is and how politics is racialized, uh, frankly, you have to attend to that too. And so that's like the other area that 
really towards the end of graduate school is where I started thinking more about that. I spent a lot of time um, in the Center for Political Studies at Michigan too. Um, and that's where I began my peek into American politics and how that plays out um, and these other factors that I'm interested in too. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so in, in, it's not just that you're drawing on these fields, but you're actively working with folks in them is what it sounds like, yeah. which does strike me as important because I, I've had a couple experiences where you have a, there's a very particular way that I think about things, just of course, based on everything that led to me being where I am now, yep. that when then you start to work with someone either in a different discipline or even who just does something slightly different within social psych, yep. your assumptions become so much clearer because yep. they'll go like, oh, wh well, why are you doing that? Or like, obviously we need to control for this. And you go, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I've never done that before. Or <laughs> you try to publish in a public opinion journal and they're like, well, obviously you need these covariates and you try to publish in a social psych journal and they go get those out of the model exactly <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually one of those funny um things that when i started working with political scientists was a point of debate at our meetings was like how many things do you actually need to control for um, right. <laughs> and like the way that i was you know trained in social psychology like that's a kitchen sink model and like you right. that's the wrong way to do it and political scientists are like, no but these are important features of people's political life you have to uh, account for those and so uh, there is this back and forth about different ways of thinking about how to do research which is sort of another thing that i've really come to appreciate over the years is what are the strengths and drawbacks of different uh, methodological approaches and when is it appropriate to use some things versus others and the like Mm -hmm. This puts you on, on the spot a little bit, but mm -hmm. are there examples of, let's even just stick with interventions, where because they stayed within one field, were less effective than they could have been? Like, is there anything that comes to mind where you go, well, if only they had incorporated these other features, this could have actually had more impact? So I will call out particular studies but but i but i'll answer the question in a different way which is and i don't mean that. by the way if you're <laughs> yeah. calling out a study it's not to say yeah. that it's bad it just means uh, it, it was appropriate for what it was trying to do but yeah. if we had added this extra layer we mm -hmm. would have extra mileage well so um let's talk about like messaging studies uh, for now and like even thinking about health messaging studies which is you know we're still in a pandemic and so there's been lots of interest in that from psychologists so the social psych way, anyway, of thinking about those health messages with, you know, you run your experiment, test what is the effect of message A versus message B on, you know, let's say intentions to wear a mask or something. And you get beautiful, significant results. And so you're like, well, this message is great. From a comm perspective, you also have to think about things like, well, how many uh, times do people need to see the message? Uh, like, what's, uh, how much exposure do you need? Um, how is that exposure, if you want to bring that to a population level, what is that going to look like in the different media markets um, and how things operate there? So that, that's one of those things that, you know, I'd done health messaging work for a long time, but didn't really, I didn't fully appreciate what that meant to scale it until being in a comm department where I'm working with health comm people who, like, that's the way that they started their training and thinking about it was like, looking at uh, differences in media markets and how exposure uh, functions work and the like. So that's that perspective, I think, has changed the way that I think about designing messages now and how I'd even go about designing a study to test them um, and figure out where and when we should use them, um, what's the what are the trade-offs associated with them and the like. And that kind of brings up the other point of applied versus what has, you know, we we'll call it basic research mm -hmm. or, or whatever people want to call it. And the, yeah, the different things you might find when you go from sort of a proof of concept mm -hmm. to actually looking at things in the field. Yep. So you've done some work doing actual field research. Is that right? Am I yeah. Yeah. Right? So what are, could you give an example of what just, just sort of a, a, a glimpse into one of the projects that you've done that you would call a, an applied or field study? Yeah. So um, so we have this study, um, this is with Allison Earl, uh, one of my advisors from the uh, University of Michigan, that it's a study looking at attention to HIV prevention messages, right? Um, so these messages that were developed to be really resonant uh, with particularly black and brown audiences. And message works really well when 
viewed sort of in a lab and other private settings, but in a public health clinic, one of the things we tested was, well, how does how well does this work um, if it's being played in the waiting room of a public health clinic? And it turns out that in that context, it really matters who else is around at the time. For our black audiences, um, especially, if you're the only black person in the clinic at the time, it's fine, you'll watch the, uh, the video. But if there are other black people around, you become concerned about uh, what they might think if they see you watching the video. And so you're not gonna watch it um, in the clinic. So this is one of those cases where um, you can develop the message and find that it works great in the lab, but without also modeling the field and what other dynamics come up in the field. In that case, it seems to be really this stigma concern issue that's coming up in the field. If you don't take that into account, then you might miss some crucial information about where and how you can um, use that message to change behavior. So for that, w- w- how much of that was anticipated? Like, was this fully like, yes, this is the thing that we think matters in this context? Because I-, I could see an argument for exploratory field work mm-hmm. that there are certain things where, like you said, it works great in the lab, throw it in the field, and just to say, ah, didn't work. You go, well, but <laughs> this yeah. is now an opportunity to be like, what was different in the field that was changing the way people viewed things? So it's sort of a two-pronger. One mm-hmm. is how much of that was built on a theory of identity in context? Mm-hmm. And then also what are the what are the bonuses we get from exploratory field work? Yeah. So um all of that was sort of necessary, right? And so one thing that was essential for even doing this work in the first place, right, was Dolores Albersin, um, Ali Earl, and others had found in numerous studies that Black audiences really wanted this information, but there was this gap in attention to it. Uh, like outside of the context of controlled, uh, highly controlled intervention settings, uh, there's lack of um, attention to it. So um, they had observed that before. And so the question is like, why? Like what is happening? Uh, in these more public settings that would lead to sort of this gap in attention. And so that's when you can sort of go back and really draw on, as I was talking about before, insights from all these fields who have studied things like HIV, things like stigma, um, and how those work, and how they've um, been racialized over time. So um, there's this book by political scientist, Kathy Cohen, actually, um, on the politics of HIV um, and um, how that's become racialized um, over time and changes the way that Black Americans think about um, that disease. So that leads you to then generate the hypotheses about, well, if this is a concern, then that might that concern should play out in a public setting, right? So that might explain why, like when the, the videos are viewed privately, there's no problem. But in a public setting, uh, there might be a problem. So then you would design a study in a public setting to see if that's actually playing out. And so that's uh, what happened to that project. I, I'm also curious about the logistics of applied work. <laughs> and, you know, it's one of those things where I have I have books on field experiments. I've read the work on, on interventions. And I go, that sounds great. But I don't even know where to start. <laughs> like, what, what? So even to get granular on just that study... What were you looking at in the wild to know that these messages were getting through to individual people? Like, like what? Like, what is the data point, and how did mm-hmm. you get it? Yeah. So in that uh, study, it was having RA sit in the waiting room and observe behavior. So that's a study of that mixes um, observational research techniques uh, with experimental methods. So we got to manipulate. So in terms of logistics, you have to work with the clinic directors, right, to get permission to randomize what videos they're playing in their waiting room um, and then sit and watch whether or not people pay attention to it. But more broadly, on the logistical question, it really depends on the nature of that study. So I've done, so the education studies, uh, you often need buy-in, depending on, you know, whether it's a public or private school, you either need buy-in from principals and and private schools, that's usually enough. In public schools, um, you need to go the layer up, usually get buy-in from superintendents. Um, With all the health stuff that's in clinics, it's either clinic directors or if it's uh, the work we're doing these days, there are groups of clinics that are all managed by the same administrators that if they say yes, then you can run the studies in their clinics. So there is a lot of relationship management with partners to be able to run these kinds of studies. 
How, how do you pitch this to a <laughs> clinic and say, we want to take your TV hostage, <laughs> decide what to put on it, and just sprinkle people in your waiting room <laughs> who are just going to kind of be eyes and ears? <laughs> yeah, so this is part of working on projects that clearly also everyone recognizes there's a problem that needs to be solved, um, or at least to be figured out better, right? So in education, the problems I focus on are these achievement gaps, right? So everyone is interested in like trying to figure out what to do about them. So if there's buy-in about the problem, you can talk about why you would need to study a certain set of processes and then why you think that design would be informative. And so it's really having those conversations about the what are you trying to figure out, why this kind of design would be uh, informative, you think, and why you need to study it in that way. In health, it's the same thing. Um, it's often a conversation about particular problems. So I, I mentioned the HIV study before. We had started doing some work around blood pressure and attention to that kind of information. So another thing that you talk to doctors, they know that these are problems. Um, and so it's really these conversations about why your study could inform us about how to address those things. So from there, it's like, if there's buying about the problem, then the harder hurdle sometimes is logistics. Um, so, you know, making sure you're going to be doing the study in a way that you're not actually getting in anyone's way. Um, so, you know, in a school, that's making sure you're not being too disruptive. So if you have to run the study where you're like pulling kids out of classroom one, one at a time, that can be really disruptive versus we're going to come in and do this. Everyone um, in the class is going to do it at the same time. It'll take 20 minutes and then we're out. You know, you can figure out those kinds of logistics, but it's a conversation with a partner to figure out how you can do the study in a way that it maximizes what you learn, but um, hopefully it also teaches them something that would be useful for them to know. So in, in a case like that, I think we, we did a, a project years ago where we were having to go into residence halls and we were looking at social networks and that sort of stuff. And there was a clear interest in like, what did you find? <laughs> yep. Could you please like present <laughs> this stuff at the end of it? And so in cases like this, how much is that relationship still continue once the data are in, once the analyses are done? was there like a meeting to sort of give a presentation or, or is it a little bit like, yeah, we'll let you, we'll give you the keys for a few weeks and then, <laughs> then our, then we're done. Yeah. So um, yeah, there are different ways of doing this kind of work. I tend to operate in a way that I'm going to go back to the communities um, and partners and talk about what we found. And if there are ways to be helpful in the long run, um, also keep the door open so that it's not just extracting knowledge and then, disappearing into the night, but um, also being um, a resource. So most of the partners that I've worked with, we've stayed in touch in some way, shape, or form. And sometimes then future opportunities come up. So we were doing work in the environmental realm. So when I started at Cornell, my first field studies here were about environmental issues. And we we're doing stuff all around the country, but a lot in New York City. And so that's what I built um, a lot of partnerships around um, in New York City was around setting environmental justice issues. But since the pandemic started, right, those same partners um, have then wanted help thinking about pandemic-related issues, right? And so then available to them to work with them on those issues as well. And maybe that will lead to future long-term studies around health, maybe not. But uh, the point is, it, this is an ongoing relationship that uh, we can work together to do science and help the community at the same time. And sometimes that's going to be the scientific studies prioritized. Sometimes that's, I'm going to be a sounding board for other issues they're thinking about. And hmm. um, it's sort of a back and forth over time. So if we think about just to go from the mechanical part of how, yeah. how these things work to what we know from studies like this and messaging about health and related things. So you've done Clearly, identity is is a through line to, to this kind of work. And one of the things that I think we're very much aligned on is this notion of the same message and priorities for one audience is not necessarily going to translate to another. And I was gonna I was gonna talk to you a little bit about that with science communication, but in the health domain mm -hmm. and this notion of identity-based motivation, what 
is the value of considering those motivations, right? And, and some examples of why we have to be attentive to that when we think about messaging in the health domain. You've given some examples, but I mm-hmm. guess at, at a broader level, conceptually, what does that mean? Identity-based motivations? <laughs> and and what does it then mean for communication? Yeah. So the broadest way that I think about this is related to what we were talking about earlier, that people end up really taking away different things from even the same messages, right? And so we have to really acknowledge and understand that, I think, to develop effective messages of when we want to change uh, behaviors. So I, I think in social psych, we often try to find like the message, right? That's going to uh, resonate with a broad audience. And sometimes we can do that, but depending again on so the histories that people have had, some messages might not land well. And I'll use pandemic-related uh, examples since that's really what I'm spending most of my time on these days <laughs> um, around vaccination. So vaccines came out in December, January, and continued to roll out. And the initial messaging was about just, you know, here are these numbers. It's 95% effective. Um, everyone should take it. And there are some people who that number is enough, right? Um, They see that number and they trust it because they've had good reason to just generally trust healthcare and the medical system. There are other people who've had long histories of distrust in that system who've constantly been mistreated by that system. So when a new message comes out from that system, there's a moment of pause to ask, is that really going to work for me and people like me? given how this system has historically treated people like me. Um, And we have to think about that. So that's come up in some of our discussions around vaccination that, um, so there's a group of healthcare workers, for instance, who, you know, they were among the first priority to get vaccinated. And it turns out that group had a lot of hesitancy. So in long-term care facilities in particular, um, had a lot of hesitancy to get the vaccine. And one of the, so I was part of a number of groups that have been working on this issue. And one thing that's come up over and over again was this concern of, well, you know, historically, and not even that far back in history, like in the beginning of this pandemic, we were always- Which feels like a long time, but but, (laughs) yeah, 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 go ahead. (laughs) But yeah, we were always uh, at the back of the line. So we were the last to get PPE. We were the last to get support. Why do you want us to go first this time? And that's when you think about that history of like being mistreated, being forgotten, it makes perfect sense to ask then, why um, do you want us to be at the front of the line this time for this new thing that just came out that, you know, there's a lot of conversation about how this was developed much faster than any other vaccine before. So, um, so you can see why people might be skeptical of, oh yeah, you're saying it's fine, but like, is it really fine? And if it was fine, why don't, why don't you want the people to, that normally get things first to get it first this time? Uh, so that's why I think it's so important to really think about these histories that people have had, because that's going to shape how they make sense of these messages. So that's what was going on in the beginning and why um, there was this initial concern. Of course, over time, as people have seen that lots of folks have gotten vaccinated, they're fine. Those concerns have uh, been diminishing over time and there's greater acceptance and the like. But that's what I mean by really thinking about the histories and identities of people, um, how that shapes their understanding of the messages they're seeing, and how that matters for how we even talk about a variety of outcomes. How do we identify those potential reactions? So one is have diverse research teams who have lots of different kinds of perspectives, but even then, you're targeting communities who are unique in Mm -hmm. intersectional ways and other sorts of ways that you you couldn't feasibly have a research team that that is has has every uh, perspective on it so are there like tangible activities one could do like is there some version of focus grouping you know i think so uh, uh, my work is in message tailoring in a lot of Mm -hmm. ways right what Mm -hmm. in what ways do people's own psychologies affect which messages resonate more than others. And even then, we're still, we're just kind of going off of the variables that have already been identified, right? I think there's a a lot of strides that could be made that aren't, and maybe could 
be if we just talk to people <laughs> but it's yes. that's what psychologists do right we just go well yes. we know what we're testing you read the message and tell us what you think um if people take nothing else away from this conversation <laughs> psychologists talk to people <laughs> you can learn a lot of things from just talking to people um so what i mean by that is one of the things i find really valuable is these partnerships I was talking about before, right? So being in the room at the health department and hearing what the doctors are saying they're hearing from their patients, what the community health workers are um, hearing from the uh, people they're working with, how the health policymakers are thinking about this and what they're hearing from their end. It provides a lot of information for doing the kind of mapping like we we have you're right there are lots of variables that have been identified but identified among particular populations as well it's something we have to remember and so sometimes there's a mapping um, from let's say the college student sample to um, other um, populations but sometimes there's not that mapping and you only know that if you are able to get that information in some way so you know in a pre-pandemic world going to communities um, and talking to people with focus groups and and the like, that was a thing that we did a, a lot of. But there's Zoom versions of this now, but having the partners who are also on the ground, still on the ground, um, who can provide that information is incredibly helpful. But then there are other um, efforts that we can also draw on. So I think there's another issue of thinking, we, the scientists in the laboratory, have to collect all of the data ourselves. Lots of other people are collecting data that is also quite useful. So during the pandemic, for instance, in thinking about vaccination, I have found the Kaiser Family Foundation's vaccine monitor project tremendously helpful. So every two weeks, they survey uh, a nationally representative sample with oversamples of uh, minority populations. And they do it in both quantitative and qualitative ways. And so I'm constantly going to their site and looking at what are people saying? in the qualitative responses and how are these numbers changing? That is incredibly informative for how I think about like, what are the concerns on people's minds right now? How are those concerns different than a month ago or two months ago? Because that's the other thing is that times are changing too. And so we have to be responsive to that as well. So we can't think we're gonna run one study that's going to really capture everything we need to know. Having these kinds of partnerships and looking to other fields and other sources can also give us a tremendous amount of rich information that helps us really figure out like where our theories are relevant and where they're not, but then um, also develop practical messages and interventions to help. Yeah, in, in you know, as you describe this, how things are changing so much from one survey to the next, it strikes me that part of the allure of doing COVID-related research and using psychology and other methods for it is is that it's so important right now yeah, we go well we have to mm -hmm. so we have these tools let's use them and, and try to be helpful yeah yep. but it's also such a moving target that i i'm a little concerned that like how much can we really accomplish in the immediate <laughs> right like uh tomorrow let's run let's run the study and then then we'll know it strikes me that a lot of this is building to be helpful next time <laughs> and yep. and it's just yeah that moving target so we had a, a messaging covid related paper come out and the first couple studies were right at the beginning of things. And we had these nice patterns and we, so we submitted it and then, you know, review takes forever. And they came back and they said, we want another study. <laughs> and we go, it's a different world now. Like it's been three months. And as it turned out, it actually worked out just fine. We, we replicated everything in some ways to my surprise because things had changed yep. so much. Yep. Um, but it just highlighted for me, like, I don't know what we, can expect to accomplish in the midst of something like this. Yep. I don't know if you've thought about that at all. Like what, what's the goal? Is the goal to be helpful now or is the goal to learn for next time? Well, different people have different goals mm -hmm. and I think both are valuable. But there, there are studies that we can run now that um, again, depending on you know sampling and uh, methods and, and timing and all of that, we might figure out patterns that we can use right now if I think we have enough contextual information that helps us make those calibrations. But then there are other things that it's good to be collecting data now that we will then just be able to archive and think about, figure out these patterns later, right? In, in some 
in some ways sort of as a historical analysis. And that's something that, so there's this paper from the 70s that was apparently super controversial at the time, but I now think it was just like way ahead of its time. And it's uh, this paper by Gergen on social psychology as history. And so there are people that really don't like that idea, <laughs> that, but I think it's incredibly important that we have to think about the historical moment that we're in and how that affects the processes in people's minds. And that's not just a pandemic thing. That was also true before the pandemic, and I think it will continue to be true after the pandemic. But I think that is why it's so important to like have these multiple disciplinary perspectives to help you make sense of what that means, right? One sort of COVID relevant example of that I've been thinking about is just like the politicization of so many things, right? Like I, frankly, before um, it happened, I did not think wearing a mask would become a politicized thing. Maybe I was naive for thinking <laughs> that, but I was just like, well, it's a health crisis um, and like wearing a mask is, that makes sense. And then it became politicized and I was like, what, what is happening? And then vaccines, same thing, uh, you know, we want to get back to normal, uh, quote unquote. I thought, well, people will want to take uh, the vaccine when it comes. And then now, like, political ideology is currently the biggest uh, predictor of vaccine hesitancy. And yeah, it's wild to me, but it's something that we have to remember then. Like, well, in this moment of everything being so hyper partisan, that's something we have to be really attentive to. Perhaps there will be a future version of America <laughs> that is less politically divided. And then we might not have to worry so much about partisanship. But we right now we have to document like how much does things like partisanship matter for these variables that we're studying and figure that out so that the next time we know, like if we are in a hyperpartisan world, well, these kinds of studies will be able to use. Whereas things that, yeah, if the world is substantially different, then maybe we'll be able to use some of the studies that we're running now. We we need to document it in order to figure it out, though. And we're not going to figure it all out right now. And just quickly drawing on an example from another domain, uh, this is another thing that's come up in sort of the history of studying climate change attitudes. Like, climate change was not always this hyper-partisan issue. Now it is. Uh, now you can't publish a paper without looking at political ideology on climate change, nor should you, because it matters so much. But there was a time that that was not the case. And so we have to remember that these attitudes that we're studying have evolved in particular histories and contexts. And so we have to remember that when we're interpreting our findings. Yeah, I, the, the hesitancy I have with the strong, maybe straw man version of the social psychist history is one could say, look, we've documented a correlation between ideology and mask wearing. Therefore, ideology is important for decisions to take public health uh, recommendations seriously. And we go, well, that is that the finding actually <laughs> that that <laughs> ideology as a variable is correlated with public health acceptance? Mm, you know, it's the content, like the theory is just incomplete, right? And if right. we had a more complete theory, it would be as true a hundred years ago as right. today. It's just that the theory didn't have, does it doesn't have all the, the pieces to it. Right. right. And so if we, if we can develop those rich theories and say, yes, maybe hopefully cross our fingers next time we have an enormous global health crisis, <laughs> we're less politically divided. You know, it doesn't mean that we can't draw on the data we're collecting now, mm -hmm. it just means that we have to be mindful of what has shifted and we should build theories that go, well, when people incorporate into their identities, be it a political identity or any other, yep. um, then those identities will matter, right? But mm -hmm. if our environment keeps those things separate from each other, <laughs> mm -hmm. then I then it won't then it won't transfer. And maybe it works differently if we're talking about mass versus uh something else. Um so that's the other piece is um there's the data of ideology and mask wearing and the extrapolation to ideology and public health messages. Mm -hmm. those, those are very different levels mm -hmm. uh, to say, well, I have this particular finding and therefore it means this more grand claim. Uh, that's the other place I think we have to be very careful 
Hey, uh, hello. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm interrupting here for a second because it's, it's at this point in our conversation that I actually kind of steer things toward talking about Neil's work in science communication, uh, which is always something that I'm interested in exploring on this podcast. And I realized that I sort of referenced something, but we never actually unpack it. So I want to make sure that that things are clear here. So a little bit ago, uh, Neil and a colleague uh, released this paper called Communicating What We Know and What Isn't So, Science Communication in Psychology. And this is published in the, the journal Perspectives on Psychological Science. And it's a very cool paper where they... They really just sort of explore the boundaries of what good science communication in psychology and sort of the social sciences more broadly could look like. You know, one of their points uh, is that we're talking about things that matter to people uh, and that we should be attentive to making sure that we're accurately conveying the information that we're getting from the research that we have. But the part that I focus on in our conversation is this part that harkens back uh, to a framework in persuasion science from many years ago, which um, has come up on this show before. Um, so one of the ways we can think about persuasion is to think about the source, the message, the audience, and the context in, what, in, in which it's happening. And Neil, interestingly, with his colleague, applies that framework to thinking about science communication, right? How do, how do we account for all of these variables? And specifically, they refer to this as the who needs to say what to whom with what effect. And I just want to unpack that just, just briefly here. So the who in this situation is the source of the message. Who's doing the communicating, right? So when we, when we want to talk to the public about science, when you're a consumer of, of science in the public, we're paying attention to where this information is coming from uh, and and who is it that's a credible source of information about science? Um, who are the people that really ought to be spreading this information more widely? The, uh, the, the second component is the what. What should we be communicating? And this is a big question about you know, what, what's the point we even want to make, right? As science communicators, are people trying to make particular points? What kind of research are we drawing on, uh, etc.? The next component is who or to whom are we communicating, which is the audience of the message. And interestingly, I'm just going to kind of pull out uh, this quote from their paper, which is that it's not useful to think of communicating to the public as an exercise in which one's job is to share the gospel of psychological science with a monolithic audience. Instead, they write that there are multiple publics that have varied interests and, and vary substantially in their understanding of science, right? So science communication needs to be attentive to the audience and, and just sort of like, oh, I just kind of want to share this information <laughs> is not is almost too broad uh, in, the, in their view. And then the final part that, that I really, you're going to see when we jump back into the conversation that I start to focus on is communicating with what effect, right? Which is, what's the point? What, what are we going to gain from talking about science with the public as consumers? What do you want to gain from communicators who are talking about science with you, right? Well, ultimately, are we trying to change policy? Are we trying to change minds? Are we just trying to educate? Um, and so this is an interesting wrinkle. So basically, point is, because <laughs> we're going to return to this framework uh, in a little bit, who says what to whom with what effect is this framework for science communication that, that Neil, among others, has written about. And it's the framework that we're going to turn to now. So I'm going to jump right back <laughs> into our conversation uh, where we pick up with this idea. And, and if we can start with to what effect, that was the part that I realized I had not spent enough time considering. So yeah. I've always been someone who enjoys science communication, right? This podcast is an example of trying yeah. to do that to get social science out to the world. But I, I haven't thought enough about what the goal is. In some ways, for me, there's just like, a, I think it's interesting. Other people probably <laughs> could find this interesting. And so let's, let's try and get it out there. Mm -hmm. So for you, in your multiple roles in science communication, what are the effects you're looking for, right? What, what sh maybe should, I shouldn't use, but <laughs> what should mm -hmm. be the impact of good social science communication? Well, I think there are multiple impacts and, uh, and that's part of the broader point that, you know, on this podcast, we can talk about, you know, the nuances of the research process and the like, and because that's the audience, right, is really interested in that stuff. In the articles that I write for 538, it's mostly really bringing 
this broader social science lens to think about contemporary problems we're wrestling with in society, right? It's not a like, here's the study, but it's like, well, drawing on uh, what we know from across social sciences, here's how we can like understand this broader moment that we're in. In the Letters to Young Scientists column, the, the goal is about helping early career researchers figure out this weird world of academia <laughs> that we're in um, and how to navigate that. So I would say, I guess my role in each of these things, it, it, it's a little bit different. Um, and Twitter is sort of this like intersection of like all of these things, right? Like I'm me and sometimes I'm going to talk about racism in America and sometimes I'm going to talk about this meme. I think that's funny. <laughs> so I, I do think it's useful to think about like, what are you trying to achieve in these different realms and then tailor what you do <laughs> accordingly. Um, when I am talking to public policymakers, for instance, that's a very different conversation of figuring out what is the problem that they are trying to solve and then going and figuring out what, what information do we have that would be useful for that problem. That's very, that can be different than, yeah, a uh, long form podcast where we're really talking about like <laughs> the history of science and how we've gotten to these different approaches to study these things. So. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's the way that I think about it. So to think about this maybe a little more concretely, I'm curious about the work that you do for 538. So I wondered if you mm -hmm. could talk a little bit about where that opportunity sprung from. And then also as a fun little game <laughs> <laughs> to take that who says what to whom with what effects and, and talk about for you when you contribute to that particular medium, just using it as an example. Yep. How do you think about who what, to whom, and the effects? Yeah, so um, so the history of um, that was last summer, pandem first pandemic summer. I mean, I've been writing a fair amount on Twitter. Uh, I, I, I mean, Twitter is my primary <laughs> like uh, medium for talking about work with broader publics. But I've been talking about sort of this issue of like what role social scientists should play and what can we say, what can't we say and the like. And I guess there are people at 538 that have been following for a while. And so they were trying to expand at the time their team of academics who write for them um, periodically. Um, and so they reached out and asked if I was interested in that. Um, and I had been thinking about writing more for the public in sort of long form ways because the way that I had done that in the past was largely Twitter threads, right? That when there was something that I felt like I had a lot to say about, I'd write a Twitter thread. But even a Twitter thread can only go so long, right? So like my general rule is to try and keep Twitter threads under 10 tweets because at, beyond that point, it, it just feels long. If I <laughs> so, see one, sometimes they get like, not yours, but I see them that are like 20, 30, and yeah, I go, I'm not reading I, that. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Though I did uh, manage a six post Twitter thread about donuts today. So like, <laughs> you, you, could, you could stretch ideas pretty far. <laughs> yeah, you can stretch it, but, but there is a limit. And so like, that's a place where I'm like, I need to keep it under 10 tweets. But sometimes I, I have things to say that are longer than 10 tweets. And so I was like, well, should I start a blog? And there were a number of people who were like, yes, you should start a blog. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, that sounds like a lot of work to manage, yet another thing. But 538 reached out. And so um, that did seem like a good opportunity, in part because they are like open to and welcome the nuance in thinking about complex social problems. So the first piece was about like, what are the methods that we've used across social sciences to study things? Um, and how does that impact like what we understand and therefore what we can and cannot do uh, to intervene in the pandemic, right? Um, and then the most recent piece, the, then there was a piece um, about like how do different groups of people think about the vaccines, right? Uh, when that was after Johnson & Johnson came out and we were trying to figure that out. And then the most recent one was about pandemic um, inequality, like, you know, there's been lots of headlines about the various forms of um, inequality during the pandemic. That's not actually surprising, given the long history of uh, inequality research um, in the social sciences from many disciplinary perspectives. And so this latest piece was, here's actually what we've known since at least the 70s, right? <laughs> um, and I was 
sort of weaving that research together to help us understand like why these things ha are happening now during the pandemic and how if we don't want them to happen again in the future, we actually need to address these underlying core issues. So that's the role um, that I've been playing there. And in terms of the who is that speaking to, the audience there um, is quite broad and much broader than I even realized at the time that um, I agreed to do it. One way of thinking about it is like lots of people who are just like really interested in data um, and data journalism. That's like a big part of their audience. But that's also led me uh, to be connected to other organizations that are doing policy work, right, that use a lot of data. So um, one of the things that struck me after my first piece there was the number of organizations that are like, we're actually trying to think about this problem um, as we build these dashboards, uh, COVID dashboards, um, and we're like trying to make sure that we're presenting information to people that would not reinforce inequality, but uh, also have more equitable outcomes. So um, writing there um, also ended up connecting me with all these other organizations that I didn't even realize like would be reading this in the first place. And so that's another, um, I've been keeping that in mind. It's like, you know, there's the casual reader who's just like really interested in learning more about data, but also lots of um, people who are trying to figure out how to use data better to inform their decisions. So that's sort of who I'm speaking to. And so how deliberately does that affect how you go about the writing process? Yeah, it um, it does affect how I um, think about the writing process because I I try to balance those audiences. Like I, I want to explain things in a way that people can read it and get the gist of what we know about you know, that particular topic area, but then also have details when, lots of details when possible when like, um, some people want to get into the nitty gritty, right? So like the latest piece, um, I did talk about some of the work on um, how much money you make and happiness. And there's some variability around that uh, uh, because things like where people live and um, and the like. And so the the foot they have a nice footnote section where you can, you can click that and get those details if you want it. And if you don't care, you don't have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. But then it's also making sure I have the links to the underlying um, academic papers and open access papers when possible um, so that, because uh, there's scholars that also read this too, right? So after that uh, recent piece came out, um, a lot of um, psychologists um, that have read it were like, I'm really interested in this like inequality and social trust piece that I read about um, because the other parts were more familiar to them, but um, that inequality and trust piece was really coming more out of political science and economics. Um, and so they're like, they wanted to know more about that. And so um, I had cited one paper in there, but I had, you know, in my back pocket from the early drafts, many more papers that so I could easily point them to that. So it's really trying to write in a way that there's something there for everyone that's going to read it. If you just want the gist, you can read it as it is. If you want more details, there are uh, places you can get that. And the nice thing for that medium is that they have these different ways of doing that, whether it's with the fit notes, they also have a great data visualization team that there are times when they will put together um, nice graphics. You can send them the underlying data and they will make nice graphics for uh, the articles and like, uh, yeah, that's another fun thing there is the data viz uh, and also the, the fact checking. One of the things I find, uh, I find really great is, so before any piece is published, there's a team that goes through and even every paper that I cite, they go through and read those papers to make sure <laughs> that uh, what uh, I said about the paper is actually true. And so, um, you know, send emailing them like, uh, the original PDFs of the papers, they will also go through it. And, they, um, and you're signing um, a lot of stuff. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and some of the ones that I've read, like there are lots yeah. of links. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's, I, I think, another like cool thing there too. So. Yeah, very cool. Well, I, I don't want to take any more of your time. Neil, thanks so much for uh, chatting with me about your work in, in research and science communication. This is all very cool to, to hear about. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, it was great to talk to you. All right, that'll do it for another episode of Opinion Science. Thank you to Neil for taking the time to talk about his work. You can find him at neillewisjr.com, and he's a good one to follow on Twitter, at neillewisjr. Links for that stuff and the research that we covered are in the show notes. Oh, and uh, here's the part of the show where I kindly but firmly ask you to leave a review of the show. If you like what you hear, you can take just a few seconds to leave a nice five-star rating and a quick comment about the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you can review podcasts. I always appreciate that. OpinionSciencePodcast.com, at OpinionSciPod on Twitter. That's where you can find more about the show and get in touch with me. But, you know, 
whatever. <laughs> That's all for now. Uh, get outside and be nice to each other. See you in a couple weeks for more opinion science. Bye-bye.